Well, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here, an honor to, to speak for this lectureship. And it, I have just been overwhelmed by how um, welcoming the Canadian audience is. So uh, today I'm going to talk about fighting cancer with your knife and fork. And let me make sure I have the controls in hand here. And here's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to hopefully leave a lot of time for questions and answers at the end. So please, as I'm going through these, if you have questions, please write them down so we can address them afterwards. So um, can diet and nutrition status help to prevent cancer? Can it help to control cancer once once you would have cancer, and can it improve overall health? And these are the general questions we're going to be addressing. Now, many of you are probably a lot more familiar with cancer in Canada, but I in, is doing part of this talk. I, I did a little bit of research. Uh, apparently, on any, any given day, there are 500 Canadians diagnosed with cancer. In 2012, um, there are going to be close to 90,000 uh, Canadian women and about 98,000 Canadian men that are diagnosed with cancer. And um, as we, as many of you know, cancer is more prevalent in men than it is in women. Men don't have that extra uh, X chromosome that's helping to protect them, and men also tend to have a little bit riskier behavior. So cancer rates are a little bit higher uh, among men than in women. The good news is that once uh, once people are diagnosed with cancer, the, the five-year survival rate is is 62%. So that has grown tremendously over the past de uh, 10 years and even before that. And, uh, and strides are continuing to be made uh, here at this cancer center as well as others. One in 44 Canadians are a cancer survivor and that kind of shows the progress in the field. So we're going to be talking about cancer, but I don't want us to lose a sight of the forest for the trees. And, and this um, cartoon says, finally, a diet I can stick with. Um, we don't want people to uh, win the war on cancer and then um, uh, lose the war on other, th other fronts. So cardiovascular disease is still a leading killer, probably more so than cancer. So we always have to be mindful that, um, that whatever we do recommend is, is good for both uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer. So I'm going to today talk about the guidelines that are out there and then the evidence to support them. And there are two sets of guidelines, uh, one that, that, that's uh, put forth by the American Cancer Society and indeed some Canadians sit on that panel, Carrie Kernier for example, who uh, is at the University of um, Alberta. He uh, participates on them on this panel, um, I participate on this panel and I'm a dual citizen. Uh, so there's a Canadian representative uh, the other uh, panel that makes recommendations for cancer survivors is the World Research Cancer Fund uh, and the, Institute, uh, the American Institute for Cancer Research. So both of them make recommendations. They're a, a little bit different, and we'll kind of go through and, and hit these bit point by point, again, with the evidence that supports them. And if, again, if you have any questions at the end, I will address them. But at the very front of this is uh, this recommendation on weight. And in fact, if you look at all the scientific studies that are out there, the strongest evidence that we have for cancer and, and being able to pre prevent it or control it really does revolve around weight control. So you see here that the American Cancer Society, their recommendation is achieve and maintain a healthy weight throughout life. Um, and uh, the uh, World Cancer Fund has a little bit more stringent recommendations. They say be as lean as possible without becoming underweight. And they really cling to what the World Health Organization guidelines for weight is, which um, is a, a BMI of 22 or less, uh, as opposed to a BMI of 25 or less, which is what we, we tend to use in, in both um, the U.S. and Canada. So let's kind of go through the evidence here on, on body weight. I must say coming from Alabama and coming up to Canada, you uh, don't have as much of the weight problem as we do. Uh, you should come down to Alabama sometime and, and uh, see. So that's really heartening, although I, I must say your smoking rates are higher than ours. So um, always work to be done. But here is uh, a chart on BMI, and um, 
uh, in coming here on the plane, I, I was talking to the, the person that was sitting next to me. I said, do you guys use kilograms or do you use uh, pounds for weight? But here's a, here's a chart for a desirable weight, which is in green. Uh, and that, that's a BMI range of 18.3 to 25. Overweight is anything that's 25 to 30. And uh, obese is considered anything from 30 and above. And if you want to find your height and weight on this chart and find out if you fall in the green zone in the, or in the uh, gray zone or in the yellow zone, um, it kind of gives you an idea of, of where you fall. So, um, uh, now how does weight play into cancer risk? Well, there are six cancers that are considered weight-related, where the data are so strong that we say, okay, that is a weight-related cancer. And um, these bars um, show all the, the weight, what are considered the weight-related cancers. And the blue bar, in the light blue bar, is um, overweight. So that's the BMI of 25 to, to 30. And the darker blue bar is obese. And how much increased risk you're at for every, um, for being overweight or for being obese. So the first cancer there is breast cancer, and that's not the breast cancer that occurs in younger women, it's the breast cancer that occurs at age 50 and over. And you see here that uh, women that are overweight have a 14% increased risk, whereas women that are obese have a 21% increased risk of getting uh, breast cancer when they get older. But here are other cancers. You have colo, uh, colon cancer. Endometrial cancer is the big one that's weight-related. And basically, by the time you, you are obese, your risk is around 2.5-fold uh, a normal weight person. Here's the line that shows double the risk. Um, but then also um, uh, obesity-related uh, cancers are kidney cancer, esophageal cancer, and this is the esophageal cancer that's really at the connection point of the stomach and the esophagus, uh, and uh, pancreatic cancer. So that's the, the new addition to the, to the list. And the, the other thing that, um, hmm, wait one second. Do I have to point, oops, sorry. There's also growing evidence for cancers of the uh, ovary and also gallbladder. So although the, there's not consensus at this point in time, soon there, will, there is likely to be consensus that those will be weight-related cancer too. So that's how weight plays into cancer risk, the risk of getting cancer. How about the risk of dying from cancer. Well, these charts here show the risk from dying from cancer. And this is obesity and cancer-related mortality for men, which is this series of forest plot, forest, um, this forest plot up here, and then women down here. And so you see here that as you become obese, your risk of cancer, your risk of dying from cancer gets significantly more the very bottom line here is cancer of the uterus, which has a, about a sevenfold increased risk. Um, for men, uh, you notice that prostate cancer was not on the list of obesity-related cancers for risk, but you do see prostate cancer uh, on this, on this uh, forest plot right up here. It's right at the top and um, the risk for, for cancer, uh, dying of a prostate cancer death is much greater among obese. So if you're obese, you're not more likely to get prostate cancer, but you're more likely to get more aggressive disease. Okay, I'm gonna switch over here because I think this is more responsive. Now, what about, so you, uh, once you have cancer, and how important is weight status at that point in time? Well, this is, these are data from the Nurses' Health Study uh, by Karen, Carolyn Krenke on a sample of over 5,000 breast cancer survivors. And what you see here is, is that women, and that's the second set of bars here, that are able to maintain their weight after their diagnosis, they do the best. Um, Women that lose a little bit of weight, they're in, they have a little bit of increased risk for, uh, and let me orient you here, the pink bar is recurrence, the yellow bar is um, uh, breast cancer mortality, and then the blue bar is all-cause mortality, so dying from all, all kinds of causes. 
And if you lose weight, there, there seems to be a little bit of an increase here in all-cause mortality if you're a breast cancer patient, but this is not statistically significant. What is statistically significant is these sets of bars here with weight gain. So um, gaining anywhere from um, 0.5 to 2 units of BMI uh, can significantly increase your risk for recurrence, for breast cancer mortality, for all-cause mortality, and the more you gain, the worse it gets. Now, what, does, what is that equivalent to? Well, for BMI units, it could be as little as a, a three-pound gain after, after diagnosis. Are all data like this? Not all of them, um, but um, the studies are basically such that there's either they, they either show that weight gain after a breast cancer either doesn't make a difference or weight gain after breast cancer causes increased risk. Uh, there are no studies really that say, well, if you lose weight, um, you're going to um, be protected. So that's how the data fall. So as far as body weight goes, um, so say you're overweight. Well, can intentional weight loss curtail risk? And here, we don't really have a large number of uh, studies that actually show that people intentionally get, lose weight. Sometimes we follow populations for many years and we see that, some, that there are some people that lose weight, but we're not able to really discern whether that weight loss is intentional or not. So um, these are studies, however, that have, done, have been done that actually look at intentional weight loss. In people that, that lose 20 pounds or more and keep it off afterwards, they can cut their risk of endometrial cancer by 4%, their risk of colorectal cancer by 10%, and their risk of uh, breast cancer, again, the breast cancer that occurs after menopause by almost, almost 20%, and overall, obesity-related can uh, cancers are down by 4%. So the bottom line on weight, achieve and maintain a healthy weight throughout life, uh, and um, avoidance of obesity during childhood is a good start, uh, and avoidance of weight gain during adulthood is probably even more important from a cancer-related standpoint. Uh, the highest risk groups that we see in, uh, with, relate, with regard to weight status are uh, women that start off being underweight, and then gain a large amount of weight during adulthood. And they really represent the highest risk category. So it's this healthy weight throughout adulthood that's important. And sometimes that's hard. Uh, at age 23, uh, on average, everybody's metabolism tends to turn down. So uh, it's much easier to gain weight after age 23 than it, um, uh, it is. And you can't eat as much as those of you that are my age in the audience know that you just can't have a cookie every time you want to have a cookie, uh, and uh, it, which is really disappointing because I love cookies. Uh, but um, but anyway, uh, this this keeping a healthy weight is very important. Strive for a BMI that's 19 uh, to 25, or uh, if you've never been a BMI of 19 to 25, then try to get as low as you've been your adult life. Okay, so that's the, those are the data on weight. I'm not going to spend too much time on physical activity. Uh, cancer researchers know that the, probably the best work on physical activity in, Canada, in cancer comes from Canada. Uh, and so I'm going to let you to your expert, leave you to your experts here to discuss physical activity uh, and uh, cancer. Christine Friedenreich, who is here, it's one of her areas of specialty. So I'm not even going to uh, mention it except to say that uh, the, both the guidelines are pretty synchronous. They say try to exercise 150 minutes a week at, at, uh, at the very least. Uh, and again, the American Cancer Society really recommends this 150 minutes a week, or 75 minutes a week of vigorous physical activity. And then the World Cancer Fund says be active every day if you can. Okay. Dietary pattern. So here's where we start to get into a little bit more of the what should you eat to avoid cancer. And you'll have to forgive me. I think I had a lot of salt for dinner, so I'm really thirsty here. Um, 
So what the recommendations say is consume a healthy diet with an emphasis on plant sources. And I know that I'm saying this in the middle of cow country, and I, I have to, I'll, I'll say in advance, maybe Alberta beef is not as bad as other kinds of beef, so <laughs> we'll give them, give a little bit of latitude there. Uh, but uh, but let's, you know, let's talk about the various components of the diet. So, uh, so the, this big, this big recommendation to try to eat as much of your diet from plant sources as possible. Choose foods and beverages and amounts that achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Again, getting back to this, this importance of weight. So um, low foods that have lower amounts of fat, lower amounts of sugar, and that don't have quite the nutrient density of other types of foods. Uh, eating 2.5 cup, 2 cups of vegetables and fruits each day. So, um, you know, get your measuring cups up there and, and load them up. And actually, the more that, that, um, that those vegetables and fruits can come from vegetables as opposed to fruits, the better off you are, because vegetables are less nutrient dense, and or excuse me, less calorically dense and more nutrient dense than fruits. Uh, fruits ha can have some sugar in them, and they don't have quite as much uh, in the way of nutrients as your vegetables do. Choose whole grains in, in preference for refined grains. So whenever you're at the store and you can get um, whole grain bread, whole grain pasta, instead of white, white bread, uh, white pasta, so much the better. But you must read the label because the food industry is very smart and sometimes they like to fool, fool us. And one real common way to fool us is to put caramel coloring into bread and caramel coloring into pasta and then label it as uh, wheat. Well, of course, all bread is wheat and all, all pasta is, tends to be wheat. So it's a marketing ploy. So check your label next time you're at the, the grocery store. Uh, and then limiting, limiting processed or red meat. And we're going to go into these data and show you the data so that you can uh, choose for yourself. So those are the American Cancer Society recommendations. Now for the World Cancer Fund recommendations. As you can see here, they're pretty similar. Avoid sugary drinks. Limit, limit energy-dense foods, foods high in sugar uh, and fat, low in fiber. Eat a variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes. And then limit consumption of processed and red meat. So let's go into some of the data here. So the, probably the, the uh, study that was done most recently is this study by um, Ann Pan, who's at Harvard and uh, was reported earlier this year. And here, this was a pooled analysis of, um, uh, and I'm, excuse me, one second here. I'm having contact lens um, problems. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna pop them out. Hold on one second. <laughs> It is the dry Calgary air. I'm just, I'm kind of going nuts here. <laughs> I should probably put this water bottle in my eye. I think I would feel a lot better. Um, so these are, this is a study that was done by the, uh, the um, uh, Physicians Health Professional Study. And, uh, uh, and now I can't see at all. So hold on one second. <laughs> I've never done this in a lecture before in my entire life. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I'm back in business again. What is that? No, no, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. So, uh, yeah, excuse me. Um, so this is a study that, that has over 100,000 patients, uh, 100,000 health professionals in it uh, that are either comprised from the health professional study or the nurse's health study. Uh, and uh, they, they looked at the number of people that had cancer-related deaths in the study. And uh, what they found is, is that there was a 10% increased risk for every three ounces of meat that um, was eaten per day. So um, what's three ounces? Three ounces about, is about the size of the back of your hand, if you have an average size hand. Um, I, I know that there's some probably some men in the audience that have bigger hands than that, but it's, it's about the size of a deck of a cards. So, um, and uh, as far as uh, processed meat goes, they also had about uh, a, an increased risk, but about a 16% increased risk for every three ounces of, of processed meat, so even more. 
Uh, and that data, those data have, I, I show these data because they're the most recent data, but there are study after study that show that red meat consumption is, is tied with uh, cancer-related mortality. Uh, and more so for some cancers than others. Colorectal cancer is probably the, the big one. Kidney cancer also uh, is very high in, in people that eat large amounts of red meat. So the recommendation that came out of this study is that if you could substitute uh, either fish or legumes or, or something for that red meat that you eat uh, so that you're not eating it every day. Uh, another tip is to at least try to cut down by half a serving a day. So one, cutting it back to one and a half ounces a day. Uh, and that could really curtail the um, cancer-related death here uh, by anywhere from 9.3% in males to 7.6% 7, 7 in females. Again, males have a higher cancer rate, and that's probably where you're going to see most of your benefit. So that's, those are the data on meat. Now, the Women's Health Initiative was actually a study that um, the data I just showed you was an observational study. And observational studies, although you can go out and you can study various populations, you can never uh, prove cause and effect. You can look at associations, but that's about it. The only way that you could really prove cause and effect is to actually intervene. Tell um, people that they have to eat this kind of diet and then monitor them for a period of time. So the Women's Health Initiative was one of those studies. And it was a study of close to um, 40,000, well, actually it was, excuse me, close to 50,000 women. And uh, what they did is they randomized with these women uh, about 20,000 to a prudent diet, which was 20% uh, or, or less of fat, at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, at least six servings of whole grains a day, and ag against people that were just in a control group. They were told not to change their diet at all. What did they find in this study? They found that breast cancer uh, actually decreased by uh, 9%. Colorectal and endometrial cancer decreased anywhere from 8 to 11%. Ovarian cancer, look at this, 40% ovarian cancer. And total invasive cancers, if you combine them all together, was around 5%. Actually, and that's, I do not have the error the wrong way. Actually, they showed an increase for that. So, good catch. I just said it wrong. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit of a conundrum. Why would these Why would these women that were assigned to a prudent diet actually have higher rates? Uh, and we don't really know. But the rest of the, if you looked at total invasive cancers or um, and these other um, other cancers, particularly breast and ovarian, uh, it uh, is uh, lower. Okay, now what about people that actually have cancer? How many people here in the audience are cancer survivors? Okay, a good proportion of people. Um, again, one out of 44 Canadians are cancer survivors, so, um, and that number is only going to grow to, to more um, over the years. Here are some observational data from breast cancer patients uh, as well as colorectal cancer patients. And they looked at the Western diet versus the prudent diet. Well, what is the Western diet? The Western diet is one that's very high in meat, high in sugar, high in unrefined, um, uh, excuse me, high in refined grains. The prudent diet is one that's very high in fruits and vegetables, high in, in whole grains, uh, and low in, in meats. So for breast cancer, uh, diet composition was not associated with risk of, of dying from breast cancer. So women that had breast cancer, if they ate um, a prudent diet, if they ate a western diet, didn't matter one way or the other as far as their breast cancer mortality. A little bit of a surprise, but the data are what they, they are. Uh, however, the Western diet uh, actually uh, was related to overall mortality and by almost a 2.5-fold increase. So the women didn't die of breast cancer, 
that were on the uh, Western diet uh, more. Or the women with breast cancer didn't die of breast cancer, but they died of other causes. They died of cardiovascular disease most of all. And that's where, that's kind of beckons back to the slide that I just showed you about the, you know, finally a diet I can stick with. Um, it's important that we beat overall mortality and try to be as healthy as we can. So uh, the message there is that the, that the prudent diet is still much better for overall mortality. Now for colorectal cancer, a little bit different story. Colorectal cancer is more related to red meat consumption than um, breast cancer is. And what you see here is that the Western diet actually predisposed uh, people that had colorectal cancer to um, more colorectal cancer death. Uh, almost a threefold increased risk of death with the Western diet from colorectal cancer. And the prudent diet um, was um, uh, not associated with any sort of protection it's just that the Western diet uh, was associated more with risk. The Western diet also was associated with overall mortality. So here, the, the, big, the big bottom line for all these data are that really the, the Western, that people should stop following the Western diet as much as possible. Uh, and uh, the fruit diet uh, is uh, maybe important but it's more not following a Western diet that really has the more, most data that are associated with it. Okay, so those are observational studies. Again, they can't show cause and effect. Here's actually a trial. It was a study called the WELL study, Women's Healthy uh, Eating and, and Living Study. It accrued a roughly, um, well, a little bit over than 3,000 breast cancer survivors that were early stage within four years of diagnosis. And this trial, what they did is they put women on, with breast cancer on a very high fruit and vegetable diet. So what's very high? Five servings of fruit uh, vegetables, 16 ounces of vegetable juice, uh, at least three fruit servings a day. The, the diet had over 30 grams of fiber, and had about 15 to 20 percent of energy from fat. And they followed these women for 10 years. What did they see at the end of this trial? Well, what they found is that um, the, uh, it really was a null trial. There was no difference really in breast cancer events, no difference in breast cancer deaths, and no difference in, in total deaths. So what good is this? high fruit and vegetable diet? Well, um, you, can, you can ask that question. The, 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 the other questions that you can ask is, well, why didn't it work in this population? And what we see is, is that this, uh, in, in starting out this trial, this trial was done in California. California is a region in the United States that tends to eat probably the healthiest of any, any part of the United States. Uh, and Janine, who's at here in the first front row, could probably tell you that. There's a lot of people in California that um, are very health conscious. So when they recruited people to this trial, notice their fruit and vegetable consumption here at the bottom. 7.4 servings a day of fruits and vegetables. How many people in this audience eat at least 7.4 servings of fruits and vegetables? Oh, okay, we have, we have some. Yeah. If I was going to say this in Alabama, there would be very few people that would raise their hands, maybe just one. Um, so this trial started out with a very high level, and so um, it, it could be the reason why we didn't see much effect in this trial. Uh, the, the number of servings of fruits and vegetables that, that your body needs may be somewhere lower than 7.4 servings uh, a day, so eating more than that doesn't really afford you any protection. The other reason why this trial may not have had an effect is that usually when you put people on a very high fruit and vegetable diet, they lose weight because your stomach can only hold around five pounds of food a day. So either you can fill up your stomach with uh, fruits and vegetables, which take up a lot of bulk, 
Uh, and then you have less room for uh, other things like cookies and candy and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, so it's very odd that these women didn't lose weight because you're adding a lot of fruits and vegetables here. So I'm going to show you uh, results now of another trial that was done in, again, breast cancer patients that had totally different results than this. Now, granted, this wasn't a high fruit and vegetable diet, but this was data from the WINS trial. And this trial recruited over 2,000 women with, again, uh, early stage breast cancer. And they assigned these women, and actually I was at Duke at the time, and I had one of these sites that participated. We assigned them to either a very low fat diet, less than 15% of calories from fat, which is a very low fat diet, or, uh, and, and made sure that we corrected their nutrient deficiencies, or to a regular diet where we said, where we looked at their, their nutrient intake and we corrected their deficiencies. And that is, um, the low fat diet is in the yellow bar, and the um, blue bar is the, excuse me one second, I'm having trouble engaging the mouse. Okay, so the blue bar is the uh, regular diet, the yellow bar is the low-fat diet, and uh, what you so see is that the, the women that were assigned to the low-fat diet, they had significantly less uh, breast cancer events than the women that were assigned to the, just the regular healthy diet. The surprising thing about this trial is that the, most of the effect was seen in women that have estrogen receptor negative uh, cancer, which is really odd because when they uh, were um, planning the trial, they said, well, where we, we really expect that we're going to see our effect is in women with estrogen positive. Uh, disease, and that is not the case at all. So this is good in one, it shows that a dietary intervention can affect cancer course, but secondly, estrogen negative, uh, or estro yeah, estrogen receptor negative disease is a disease where few, um, we really have a, a much lower cure rate and where our chemotherapeutic agents don't do so well, so good of a job. So it does offer hope that we can actually change our diet and make a difference. So completely different findings. Uh, but another reason why this study may have worked, oops, and excuse me, uh, let me go back here. Oops. Now, I'm in trouble. Um, okay, let me go back. Got it. Yeah. The other reason why this, this trial um, were, uh, may have worked is that the women that were on the low-fat diet, they lost weight. Uh, so they and they lost on average six pounds. So to this day, we really can't disentangle was it the low-fat diet or was it the weight loss that really caused this effect? Um, and uh, so there, um, there's a there could be multiple reasons why this trial worked and the other one didn't. So the bottom line on diet is consume a healthy diet with emphasis on plant sources. Choose foods and beverages in amounts that that would achieve and maintain a healthy weight, eat 2.5 servings of vegetables and fruits each day. We probably won't see too much more benefit with 7.4. Uh, choose uh, whole grains instead of refined grains, limit processed and red meat, and then also limit consumption of salty foods, which I, I wish I would have done today just for thirst reasons. But um, salty foods are, are tied to aerodigestive cancers, so cancers of the esophagus uh, and head and neck cancer. Uh, the populations where, where um, salty foods really tend to increase cancer rates are in Asian populations that have a lot of salt, salted cured uh, either pickles uh, or fish and those, those can increase cancer risk. Uh, cancers of the mouth, cancers of the esophagus have really, uh, and cancers also of the stomach have decreased considerably since we've gotten refrigeration. It used to be that we always would rely on salting as a way to preserve our foods. And since we don't do that anymore, uh, those cancers have really declined. <laughs> Okay, alcohol. Um, 
and he, the recommendation here is drink one to um, one uh, limit servings to one if, one serving a day if you're a woman, two servings a day if you're a male, and that's really judged on body weight. Uh, and the the World Cancer Fund really recommends the same thing. Now this is a little bit of a conundrum because actually if you were going to say what amount of alcohol is safe for cancer? Uh, the answer would be there's no safe amount of alcohol. Uh, there's no, um, this is not a, um, a disease like heart disease where you actually get protection. For cardiovascular disease, there's actually a benefit to drinking one to two glasses of, of um, wine or, or beer a day. Um, not so with cancer. It, it exposes you to risk, and there's a linear risk with cancers of the head and neck, with cancer, with breast cancer, um, and that sort of thing. And this is a, a, a big question for survivors, because again, I'm I'm going to point you back to the fact that we we have to protect ourselves against not only cancer risk, but we also have to protect ourselves against cardiovascular disease. Now, cardiovascular disease among cancer patients is even higher. So if you've ever been diagnosed with cancer, your risk of, of having cardiovascular disease is much higher. So I deal a lot with women that have breast cancer, and they always ask, well, what should I do about alcohol? So the pros, uh, and here are the, the two studies that are, sorry, four studies, pros and cons of drinking alcohol after breast cancer. Again, for primary disease, for your risk of getting breast cancer, no amount of alcohol is safe, but say you've already had breast cancer. So there has been a study that was done by Redding. And the, the, her results show that there uh, is a 30% increased survival rate among breast cancer patients that drink zero to, dr to, zero to three drinks a day, uh, as opposed to people that don't, as opposed to women that don't drink anything. Uh, and in fact, she even shows that women that drink on average one drink a day uh, have a 40% increased survival. And that's a fairly large study, a study of around um, over uh, 1,000 people. Another study that shows a favorable effect of alcohol is uh, one by Trentum Dietz, and she found that, uh, that women that drank after a breast cancer diagnosis had a 55% lower risk of ovarian cancer. And we do know that breast cancer and ovarian cancer tend to travel in pairs, uh, and that women that are diagnosed with breast cancer uh, have a higher rate of ovarian cancer. So that's heartening news. Okay, what's the on the opposite side? Uh, well, there's two studies, one done by Kwan and another one by, done by Lee. And the one by Kahn showed a 35% increased risk of recurrence and a 51% increased rest, risk of breast cancer death with, um, with alcohol use. Uh, and the one by Lee showed that, the, that there was an increased risk of contralateral disease or con contralateral breast cancer. So the bottom line is this with alcohol and breast cancer. Um, basically, the, the risk of getting a, a progressive or a contralateral uh, breast cancer is increased with further alcohol use. But the incidence of getting perhaps another type of second primary and heart disease is, is lessened significantly. So um, I but we tell our breast cancer patients is look at your family history. If you, uh, if, the, if you have breast cancer and that's a disease that in your family is very lethal, you may want to stop drinking. If this is, if you have a breast cancer and uh, people in your family uh, are much more prone to cardiovascular disease, then you probably do need the alcohol, and it's probably cardioprotective. Uh, so make your choice that way by looking at your family tree. There, um, but there's always new data every day, and so we always have to keep our, our uh, eyes posted to the horizon. So the next area is supplements, and this always gets a lot of controversy. 
Um, the uh, number of people that take supplements is around 50 to 60 percent of the of the populace. So I'm going to have I'm going to see a show of hands here. How many people take vitamin or mineral supplements in the audience? Okay, most. What you're what I'm going to say next, you're not going to like at all. Uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. So what's the recommendation on supplements? Although I'll uh, hopefully after we get done with this lecture, talk about how you use uh, supplements responsibly. So rely on food as a source of, of um, nutrients is the American Cancer Society recommendation. Uh, and the uh, World Cancer Fund is, says do not rely on supplements to protect against cancer. You could use them to protect against uh, osteoporosis. You could use them to protect against uh, macular degeneration. But from what we know, it, with cancer, it's premature to take a supplement in hopes that it, it will have um, benefit for cancer control. So let me kind of go into, well, why is, why did they make this stance? So um, we know for studying uh, uh, various antioxidants in cell culture uh, and different nutrients in animal feeding studies, that there are a host of nutrients that show protection in those model systems. Uh, but uh, can you reap the benefits of these foods um, through the uh, various, through taking a supplement? And do we see that benefit in humans? So let's go through the, let's go through the, the data and let's see what the data say to us. Well, the very first trial that was done for chemo prevention was a study that was done in China. And this was done in like the 1980s through the 1990s. It's the Lin Shin study. And what uh, this study did is it took around um, close to 30,000 people in China that had nutrient deficiencies. And uh, what, it, uh, what they did is they randomized people to either a placebo or a supplement. And the supplement could have been beta carotene plus vitamin, vitamin E and selenium. And what they found with this study was really remarkable, that this using this supplement actually reduced cancer deaths by 13%, and it was very instrumental in gastric cancer. Again, uh, in China, uh, as in m many Asian uh, populations, the gastric cancer is a, is a huge cancer there because of the high salt intake and the um, uh, salt-cured fish and, and that sort of thing. So uh, this was really the first primary prevention trial uh, that supported antioxidants, antioxidant nutrients, and people were very excited about this trial uh, and uh, anxious to do other studies in this area. So the, they set up two other trials, uh, and the next ones that followed on the heels of the Slinchin study were the ATBC trial, alpha tocopherol and beta carotene trial, and that was done to prevent uh, lung cancer in close to 30,000 Finnish male smokers. And what they did is they randomized these men to either a placebo or to beta carotene or to vitamin E or to both the, the beta carotene and the vitamin E. And then they looked at lung cancer. Um, this trial was the proverbial rubber cigar uh, because they, this trial was set up to see if we could reduce lung cancer. And what happened with the, the people that were taking the beta carotene, they, they actually had higher rates of, of uh, lung cancer. So here we, you know, we have a trial all set up thinking that it's going to work and it, it boomerangs uh, back. The vitamin E didn't have any effect, just the beta carotene. And at the same time, uh, a trial called the CARAT study, uh, the carotene and retinol efficacy trial was being done in just a little bit south of here, in mostly at Fred Hutch in Washington. Uh, again, that was set up for lung cancer pre uh, prevention, and this was done in smokers, both genders, so males and females, uh, and asbestos workers. And this was a trial that looked at um, beta carotene plus the preformed vitamin A, retinol, versus placebo. Well, actually at the time that the, the ATBC trial, the, the one that's on the top, was being uh, analyzed, 
they looked at the results and they, they repeated them, repeated the analysis again. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. And they called up the people that were at the Fred Hutch and they said, you better take a look at your data and you better tell us what you're seeing. And so they broke code, they analyzed their data, and this is one of the few trials that was ever stopped. Uh, when trials are, are done, they uh, usually they do an interim analysis and they have what are called stopping rules. Uh, and this one was um, actually, um, the blind was cut prematurely, the stopping rules were, um, were imposed. Because in this trial, not only was, um, did they increase lung cancer with the supplement, but the lung cancer was increased by 28%. So um, again, a trial where we thought a vitamin supplement would work based on observational data. Up to this point in time, we looked at the observation data and said, oh, well, it looks like those guys that, that, that eat a lot of beta carotene uh, have lower cancer rates. We'll take the beta carotene out of, um, and and we'll just use the the supplement that or use that purified supplement, and we'll see what it does to cancer rates. Well, this is what it did to cancer rates. Um, and then there's some more. There's some more failures. Uh, the SELECT study uh, that looked at uh, selenium and vitamin E. Uh, what, what did we find from that study? It was done in over 20,000 um, men uh, that were at risk for prostate cancer. It showed that the men that were on vitamin E had an increased risk of prostate cancer, not a decreased risk. And that the men that took the selenium actually had an increased risk of diabetes. So we've, we, we, um, give supplements and uh, end up with the um, uh, not the result that we wanted. Uh, folate supplementation in individuals with col colon polyps, again, failed study. And um, there was a, so the prevailing mantra that we had as nutritionists was, well, whatever you do, it's not good to take like one nutrient supplement. It's very, because as we know from cancer, when you treat people that have cancer with, um, with one agent, it's very unusual that that one agent's gonna work. We usually, when we give chemotherapy, we give a chemotherapeutic cocktail so that it interrupts various po po points in the cell cycle and can arrest cancer growth. So surely if we have a multivitamin supplement, that should work better. And then we got observational uh, data from the AARP study that showed that uh, supplementation with multivitamins, with, uh, that men that uh, took, those, took multivitamins had an increased risk of prostate cancer. So, so much for our thought that, well, multivitamins are all right. Now, actually today there was a late-breaking uh, study that was done at the AACR. Uh, it was done by Gaziano, again, on the uh, Physicians' Health uh, cohort. And what they found in that study was that the men that took multivitamins actually had a decreased risk. So these data are still in flux, but until uh, we, again, we have a, um, a randomized control trial, we won't know the answer. So um, still stay tuned here. But this kind of goes on to uh, some trials that have been done. Those, those trials that I just talked about were done in healthy populations. Here are trials that are done in cancer survivors. So here is a trial done by Berady. I think it's actually a study that was done in Quebec. Uh, and uh, 540 uh, head and neck cancer patients that were either given uh, vitamin that were given vitamin E plus beta carotene, and what you see here is here are the Kaplan Meier curves. And let me see if I can. Yeah, I think I'm going to use the mouse here. But let's see if I can engage it. Here we go. So here you have survival, and as far as the survival goes, the survival is much better with the placebo than it is with the supplement. So um, the death rate was, in fact, 38% um, higher with the supplement than it was with the placebo. So um, my advice to you is if, if uh, now granted, when you're in a clinical trial, you can't pick which arm you're assigned to. That's part of the beauty of being in a clinical trial. But what you hope for is that, that you're in the placebo arm for many of these. 
So, um, I, Gary Larson is one of my most favorite cartoonists, but it's this this uh, cartoon really sums up some of our uh, history with the supplement use. It, it, the caption is, it's time we face reality, my friends. We're not exactly rocket scientists. And so um, there's lots of things that can go wrong as you try to take a nutrient from a food and then try to pin various qualities on it. Um, so one of the things is, is it the supplement itself? Is it the exact uh, same isomer that's in food? Is it an imbalance of, um, usually when, you're, when you have a carrot uh, and you're going to get carotene from that carrot, it's in various forms. It's in alpha, beta, gamma types of forms. When you pick up a supplement, it's generally in like beta carotene. So is it the specific um, isomer that they use? Perhaps. Uh, is it the dose? And here are some um, uh, data that show that maybe it is the dose and maybe it is the host. So you have to be aware of both. So here is um, the, some results I, sh I showed, well, I, sh I gave a little recap of the SELECT trial and uh, why that ended in, or, or uh, the, the data that showed that that ended in failure. But what you see is that it um, really depends on what your, your selenium status is starting off. Those in the bottom third so if you were deficient in selenium, you actually got a deep decrease, decreased risk by about 50%. If you were kind of in the middle ground, you still had a decreased risk. But men who took selenium and men who already were well nourished and took the selenium on top of it, that's when you, when you get into trouble. They actually have an increased risk. So those are those data. Here are data from the folate trial. Again, this was one of those trials I pointed to as a negative trial. But when you do the secondary analysis on that trial and you look at people that uh, were actually coming into that study and had low levels of folate, well, they actually reduced their, their incidence of colorectal adenoma by almost close to 40%. <coughs> However, those that had high baseline folate, they increased their risk by, by 28%. So again, so much depends on what your nutrient status is when you take those supplements. Is this surprising? Well, not really. In the 1500s, there was a, um, the father, father of modern toxicology, his name is Paracelsus said poison is in everything and no thing is without poison. Dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. So one is, one is dose and one is host. And really, if you are deficient and you take um, a dose that's fairly low, you will probably see a decreased risk like that's on this curve. If instead you're like most of the population, uh, and is all right status, not, not great, not, um, uh, not too bad, and you take a low dose, you probably won't see too much of an effect. If instead you're already very well nourished and you take a high dose of a supplement, you will probably put yourself at more risk. So um, it really does pay to know where you're starting off. So before you would take a, a nutrient supplement, see, go to a nutritionist, find out what your diet is. Don't make any assumptions. You know, sometimes it's so easy to say, oh, I don't eat an, uh, a well-balanced diet. I'll just take a supplement. Have a nutritionist really assess whether you're eating a, a well-balanced diet or not, or get your blood tested. Uh, now, granted, some of these tests are not easy to do and are not done routinely, clinically, um, but, but some are. So let's talk about the new darling on the, on the supplement scene, which is vitamin D. Uh, and that is, um, and sh you know, really, should we be concerned about that? And what did the data say to us about vitamin D? 
so let me. So here's a little pictorial about vitamin D metabolism. Uh, you can get vitamin D through a host of various sources. Uh, one, you can get vitamin D from the food you eat. Fish has vitamin D. Milk is now is fortified with vitamin D, uh, and uh, you can get it through dietary sources and eat it, and it goes through your intestine, that sort of thing. And that's one way to get it. Uh, and you can also get it through supplements. Another way that you can get vitamin D is through the sun, and that's why vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin. Um, there is this cholesterol form of cholesterol, uh, seven dehydrocholesterol that that lingers underneath the melanin um, uh, layer, of the, the, the layer of the skin that has melanin in it. Uh, and when the UV light hits it, it gets converted um, to D2. Now that conversion really depends on how much sun you get. Now granted, in Canada, um, you get very, you probably, you're at a latitude that doesn't get as much sun as in where I'm from, Alabama. So you might be at a, at a higher risk of a deficit. People that are even at higher risk for deficits are people that have a lot, large amount of melanin in their skin. So if you're um, black, then you're probably not going to convert as much vitamin D uh, because that melanin interrupts the, the conversion. Um, so that, that vitamin D2 then goes to the liver, then goes to the kidney, it gets converted to vitamin D2 here, vitamin D3 here, and then it's available for your body to use for all the, the things that vitamin D does, which is to maintain the skeleton and to, to uh, serve various functions around the body. Immune system may be particularly important for cancer. Here, again, are various uh, sources of vitamin D a day and getting a dietary intake of four, four uh, sorry, 400 to 600 IUs a day is what's recommended. Six, 600 is, is more the, the, the uh, norm if you're an adult. And uh, again, fish sources. Um, and how much vitamin D that you can get in the sun. Up to 10,000 IUs in the summer in the midday. Okay, so what are vitamin D? Well, I just showed you the slides as far as folate goes, as far as selenium goes. And here are data from the Women's Health Initiative and uh, looking at vitamin D uh, intake or, or risk as associated by baseline intake. And women that were taking very low doses of vitamin uh, D and then took a supplement, they decreased their risk by 21%. As you increase your intake, you find that you get much lower benefit from that vitamin D that you take. But again, with 600, then in it, uh, and if you add that, um, sorry, if you add a supplement on top of intakes that are already 600, you increase risk by 30, 34%. Here are data from um, uh, that look at actually the level that's in the blood, vitamin D in the blood. Uh, and people that are deficient, again, if they take vitamin D, they cut their risk. So it's beneficial. But as they get more and more well-nourished, the, the risk that they uh, have is not a lower risk, but is actually a higher risk. And you see here that uh, it increases to, 30, again, 34% once it's above 58. So there's, there's a, a, a balance as far as nutrients go. And it's important that we get sufficient amounts of nutrients, but not too much. And here are the, here's a, a slide that shows um, uh, the various levels of um, uh, vitamin D, what's considered deficient, insufficient, sufficient. Uh, and uh, the only thing I would say to you is if you do take vitamin D now, to get your levels done uh, and get them done routinely. Uh, so that, uh, because the vitamin D is helpful if you, if you do have a deficiency. It's just not too helpful if you're already well nourished. So, um, nothing new here. So the bottom line on supplements, rely on food as a source of nutrients, but if you're considering 
supplementation. Have a dietitian analyze your your diet. Let you let you know you know if you are deficient or not. Check your blood levels for nutrients. For vitamin D, which is really um, what a lot of uh, practitioners are checking now, uh, please have that done. Uh, consider the lowest dosage. So if you are deficient, don't go for the highest dosage that you can possibly have. Now granted, uh, there is a real prevalent form of um, uh, vitamin D therapy where they just where you just take a, a very high level um, uh, of, a, of a supplement for a limited amount of time. And that's fine because the vitamin D is actually absorbed into your fat and gets absorbed over time. Uh, but don't continue on that vitamin for a long period of time with the high dosage. And if you are currently on supplements, other supplements, um, you may want to consider, and if, if indeed you find that you are well nourished and that a nutritionist looks at your diet and says, oh, you're doing just fine, weaning yourself off uh, supplements. Now, you may have to wean yourself off slowly. One of the things I, I can tell you as a practicing nutritionist, the, the, um, one of the nutrient deficiencies that I have seen clinically is scurvy. Uh, and I generally see it in, in um, uh, people that uh, take vitamin C in high doses for over the winter because they want to prevent colds. And then when the springtime comes, they stop taking their vitamin C and they then their teeth start rattling around in their sockets, uh, and uh, which is a sign of uh, a clinical manifestation of scurvy. So if you are taking supplements, it's important maybe to cut them in half, you know, cut them off slowly. So cut them in half and cut then quarter them and then um, get down to, to no dose at all. So the, the last bit of the, the talk, I'm going to deal with functional foods and just kind of give a, a brief introduction. I'm just going to look at the time. Here we go. Um, functional foods are whole foods that uh, and uh, fortified, enriched, or enhanced foods that have uh, special properties, uh, potentially beneficial effect on health and as consumed as part of the regular diet. Uh, I know that when I talked to the radio host today, he was really keen on goji berries. Uh, and there are various foods that we can eat that have uh, very interesting effects and that as a nutritionist I want to study these foods because they are compelling. Uh, it, however, and one of the foods that's on this list we actually do study. So the list here, soy uh, because of its phytoestrogens, uh, tomatoes because of their lycopene content, we study flaxseed, flaxseed because of its omega-3 fatty acid content as well as its lignin content. And we've seen uh, very nice results along with uh, Lillian Thompson, who also does flaxseed research, who's at the University of Toronto. She does work in prost uh, breast cancer. We do work in prostate cancer. And both of us have seen in humans and also in animal mo models that the eating flaxseed actually lowers proliferation rate in the tumor. However, I'm going to say to you, I, I, I realize that this is a public lecture, and even though our results are really, really compelling, there's only really two researchers that have, uh, have studied this, uh, our, our lab and Lillian Thompson's lab, and these results really do need to be uh, repeated so that we can have some consensus on them before we really blow them out to the national, you know, the, the um, uh, broader public. Broccoli is important because of the indole content. Garlic, because allium compounds are, are very uh, important. Berries, curcumin, which is in turmeric, uh, has had a lot of cancer uh, fighting studies done on it, primarily in cell culture. Green tea, and then also red wine. So these, these are uh, considered functional foods. There's others. There are things like goji berries, nani juice, uh, a whole host of other functional foods here. But these uh, have probably the most amount of research done on them, yet we are still at the point of, of uh, not having enough for um, consensus. 
So um, my time is drawing near close. I want to make sure that we have time for questions because usually the questions are the things that um, uh, are really the most compelling. Uh, so in summary, there is a role for diet in pre preventing and controlling cancer. Weight management is very important. Uh, but eating a plant-based diet that's nutrient-dense and limited in calories also is. And to rely on food as a source of nutrients. But again, a lot more research has to be done. So with that, I will take, we can have the lights up and we can start to take questions. All right. interesting. I've got a million yeah. questions, but I won't hog the floor. I want to thank Wendy for such a wonderful talk and even sans contact lenses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll let you moderate the okay. floor for questions. Anybody have any questions? Question? No? Okay. You in the very, very back, top row. I was just wondering, were you eating on the floor? Because you live Yeah. Where does soy fall? Um, I mean, the, the populations that have the most protection from soy are those that actually grew up with soy. So your Asian populations that started eating soy out of the womb. Um, however, that being said, um, there there used to be a lot of concern, particularly for breast cancer survivors, that somehow if they ate soy, uh, that, that it would, it would um, interfere with the, the estrogen, um, the um, estrogen, uh, or the hormonal uh, treatment that they were on. As it turns out, the amount that, of soy that you can have without affecting that is, a, is anything that's less than three servings a day is really not going to put a woman with breast cancer at risk uh, and that is still taking hormonal therapy for breast cancer. Uh, as far as soy goes for, for healthy people, it's a good food. It's, it has a lot of, um, uh, just a lot of benefit, a lot of nutrient in it. Um, would I recommend anything over three servings a day? Probably not, because everything in moderation is good. And so three servings a day would be a, a, an ample amount of soy. Uh, so you, chances are, unless you're really drinking three glasses of soy milk, you're eating tofu and miso, and uh, for every meal, you're not going to get that much. So, good food. Okay, so was that the glycemic index, did you say? So there's been a lot of work on the glycemic index. It's, it's somehow somewhat hard to measure because the glycemic index not only depends upon, um, and let me just qualify, so there might be people that don't know what the glycemic index is. So the glycemic index is, is uh, an index which is used to measure how much your, the glucose rises in your blood after you have after you eat something, uh, and uh, some things are not surprising. Like if you ate um, a teaspoon of sugar, your glucose would rise fairly quickly. Uh, but some things are uh, and a little bit surprising in that things like ice cream, you would say, oh, well, I bet you that has a high glycemic index. As it turns out, ice cream really doesn't have that high of an index because the fat kind of keeps that glucose from being um, um, absorbed into the bloodstream right away. Uh, but things like white, white potatoes and white rice have very high glycemic indexes. So there, there has been quite a bit of work it's somehow sometimes a little bit difficult to measure glycemic index because it not only depends on the food that you eat, but how that food is eaten. So if you eat potatoes, high glycemic index food, but you eat them and you have a pork chop along with it, that changes the whole glycemic load that you that your body does get. Um, so, 
bottom line, a lot more work has to be done. Theoretically, it's, a, it's an appealing concept because what we're, we're, we're now looking into as far as nutrition goes is how does it have its effect on the cancer? And is it through in, increases of insulin and all the downstream pathways underneath the insulin, mTOR being one of them, uh, that, um, that could affect the cancer. Uh, it could. Uh, and I'm giving you a very long-winded answer, I realize, to, uh, to something I'm going to say, we don't know yet. Um, we just don't know. There's compelling, there's compelling reason to believe it will be important, though. Dairy and eggs uh, are, you know, the, th the thing is, is there, uh, if, if we can eat lower on the food chain, perhaps better. Uh, and of course, those are, uh, you know, dairy products and, uh, dairy products primarily, uh, could, be, could be a source of, um, and now I'm going to really get into a whole bunch of trouble. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to defer again and say we you know really there's not enough evidence to suggest that you would cut them out of your diet, uh, but to uh, but to just watch it within limits, and not non-fat dairy go that it's fine. Uh, it's the fat component that we're most concerned with. And eggs, eggs are um, eggs are fine, yeah. They're 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 a good source of protein, uh, and uh, but uh, again, everything in moderation because again, you want to watch out for for heart disease too. Even though it's been said that cholesterol doesn't matter, that's true. But you don't want to eat egg, eight eggs a day. So sometimes it's amazing what happens when you uh, are in uh, lectures like this. People say, oh, I remember you were at that, that, that uh, lecture and you said that, that uh, uh, bologna was fine. So I started eating all kinds of bologna. And that's not the message that I want to give here. Um, every, you know, everything in moderation is important. No, Barry? Well, I mean, obviously, it's less alcohol than, than the, the regular dose. However, um, again, it's one of those, alcohol is a funny thing. Yeah, no alcohol is safe for breast cancer. And I guess, I mean, really, if you come from one of these families where breast cancer is lethal, uh, and, you know, there are families where it is, um, uh, I, I would probably say caution you against it. However, for most people, breast cancer is a sporadic mutation. So, uh, and it's going to be one of those that you, um, you know, that, that uh, you really have to be concerned about heart disease. So if you enjoy one beer a day, you know, um, yeah, you might run the risk of having uh, increased contralateral disease, but you have to, it's a, it's a trade-off between that and, and having, you know, and being above ground, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, anything that is, is grass-fed that actually is free-ranging and has the ability to um, to to uh, actually eat 
things other than cow chow, you know, Purina cow chow and all this other kind of stuff, um, is, uh, is going to, it's going to have a higher omega-3 fatty acid content. Same thing with chickens that are, are able to be free ranging chickens. Um, so, uh, you know, has it been proven? No, it hasn't been proven in cancer. Is it theoretically appealing? Yes, because some of the pathways that are involved with cancer are, uh, would be um, uh, favorably disposed by eating omega-3 fatty acids. And that's why we're interested in flaxseed. And you can get omega-3 fatty acids from flaxseed as well. So. Uh-huh. Yeah, well the oil um the they do have flaxseed oil uh it it has a very um most flaxseed oils unless they're enriched with lignin will have fairly low levels of lignin which is where the the phytoestrogen comes in. Um, again, the, the work of Lillian Thompson shows that actually eating flaxseed is synergistic for, for, fighting, um, for fighting breast cancer. So, so uh, one, many people get cancer, want to enhance their survival. Sure. And so they want to help their chemotherapy physician or their radiation oncologist give them the best fighting chance they can. And so they turn to uh, vitamins, mega vitamins. They stop by health food stores and try to do everything right. What I heard you say this morning was that we're really subject to a marketing scheme that's pushing an agenda that without any evidence. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I'm the, the leading um, uh, vitamin producer, Hoffman LaRoche, makes billions of dollars every year on supplements. Um, and you're right, the, 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 you know, I think the, the, when a, a person's diagnosed with cancer, the first stop that they make is to General Nutrition Center. And there is a salesperson that's just wanting to sell them all the products that they can possibly give them. Um, and, you know, I think we, we fall into this uh, you know, we feel insecure about our diets. We, we don't know if we, you know, we eat on the run, that sort of thing. It's still possible to eat a fairly good diet and still be eating on the run. Uh, and very few uh, Americans, very few Canadians are malnourished. Uh, and that's, and you're right. I mean, I think, I think there, uh, I think we really need to be cautious and we need to be good consumers. Uh, and and really think of our bodies almost like we would our houses. You know, do, do they really need a paint job now? No, I just got a paint job like, you know, <laughs> three months ago. Why do I need to repaint my house again? Um, you know, but yet we're willing to take any kind of supplement. We're willing to, um, you know, put our bodies through a lot. Uh, and they're not just, they're not be any evidence. So now... That's not to say uh, that in some of these areas, evidence isn't growing. Um, again, uh, there is work being done in, in soy, work being done in berries, uh, and that may, that may actually turn out to, to um, uh, yield some very interesting findings. But I think what you need to do is you need to say, well, you have to balance that with the risk. So. Uh, generally speaking, it's a lot healthier to consume a food than it is to consume a supplement. So if you're, you know, if you're wanting to take, or, or um, wanting to take omega-3 fatty acids, for example, is it better to consume them in the form of fish uh, or in the form of flaxseed than it is to t get the purified supplement off the shelf? Yeah. Um, there's very few cases in life where you actually get toxic amounts from foods you eat. Okay. 
There's actually a very interesting study that was released probably about two months ago on organic food. Now, granted, it wasn't a great study in that it was a meta-analysis of, I think, probably about four studies, most of which were done in children. Um, so, again, data are very limited. Is it a great idea to go and eat pesticides? Probably not. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that people go and, and eat them. However, uh, if you went to the grocery store and you saw, usually it's organic vegetables, and you saw organic lettuce that was sitting there and looked like it walked across the country to get into that display, <laughs> I, even if it was organic, I would say, no, I'm not going to really get very much nutrient value out of that lettuce. Uh, is, is, uh, so I would probably opt for in or, you know, the uh, traditionally grown lettuce, if that were the case, because you eat food because of its nutrients. The, the other thing that you need to realize is that plants make their own pesticides. So you know, the second that that plant well, maybe not the second, but when that plant um, becomes chewed on by a, an insect, it will arouse an immune response, just like you would, uh, your body uh, arouses an immune response when you get cut or whatever. So you, it's not that uh, organic foods are free of pesticides, because in some cases, if you analyze that, that vegetable that has been grown organically, um, it could have just as much pesticide as the, the stuff that's grown traditionally. Do you believe in the Dirty Dozen? I do. I think that there are, you know, so Dirty Dozen. Uh, so those are vegetables that have high amounts of pesticides. For example, celery is one of them. Um, and so for those foods, it might be worthwhile to say, okay, I'm going to choose a, an, um, an organic Version. And that's one way that you can kind of cut your loss. And just one other thing. So for regular foods, what do you recommend in terms of cleaning it? Oh, soap uh, not soap. Uh, you know, pesticides are, they're lipophilic, so they're, they're fat-soluble in most cases. Now, there are some pesticides that go right into the, like, alar that goes right into a, a, an apple. But for many of the pesticides that are used, they tend to linger on the, the outside surfaces. So to, to, you know, if you have a, uh, a cabbage, for example, you peel off the outer leaves. Uh, and then um, because uh, the pesticide is lipophilic, it generally will, um, uh, you can cut that with a, a weak uh, acid like lemon juice or vinegar. So you can use like a vinegar or, or lemon juice bath, dilute, you know, it doesn't have to be the pure stuff, just to wash your fruits and vegetables in. Um, there's, there are commercially available um, washes, but th this is cheaper. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's pluses and minus to, minuses to everything. You know, I think that um, uh, I, I still would opt for brown rice, um, even even with some some level of of. Uh, yeah, there is. But it's a question, it's a question of, yeah, there's arsenic in, in lots of, there are, there's arsenic levels in lots of foods, um, and natural arsenic in foods. For example, peach pits uh, are uh, very high in arsenic. Um, so I still would opt for brown rice. Take your chances. Well, this has um, been super interesting, um, and it's great to have such a well-informed audience. Yeah, questions. it is. Thank you. Wendy, we'll probably hang around for a few minutes if you have any questions that weren't addressed, but um, please join me and thank you very much. Thank you.